Okay everyone, welcome back. Um, what I'm going to talk about in part two of this tutorial is uh, requirements and how risk analysis can help us outline initial uh, design and possible design elements. And we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the other things I said I'd talk about, like uh, documentation, interoperability, and, uh, and a few case studies with Karis have used in practice, and how you can find out more about Karis in general. So requirements and goals in Kairos have um, two particular areas that will be of interest to you. Um, we support something called the CHAOS, um, Goal and Obstacle Modeling Language. So this is really based on requirements as system goals. And we have this nice top-down um, visual notation for modeling goals and obstructions to the goals. Um, we also support... Um, uh, Valeri requirement specification templates. Now, Valeri is an industry recognized template uh, for, 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 for requirements. And you can use both. Uh, you could use either, should, uh, should, should you so wish, but as we'll mention shortly, there are times when you do have to use both. Now, the main difference between the two is that goals and obstacles in chaos are in the environment specific. So, what this will allow us to do is to imagine the system or system requirements that might be necessary in different environments. However, requirements are not environment specific. They can be associated to assets and environments, but by themselves are not environment specific, which kind of makes sense because requirements always need to hold no matter what. And we also have this concept of domain, domain properties, which are part of chaos, which are statements or hypotheses or assumptions about the system and these aren't environment specific either now as i said you can use one what you can use you can use either but if you want to specify countermeasures to risks you have to specify both and we'll find out why shortly um so here are the key concepts we have a requirement um, and we have a goal and the goal can be refined to a requirement. We don't see it here, but we'll see shortly how requirements can be linked to other requirements as well. We have this idea of an obstacle. Now, what an obstacle does is that it obstructs a goal. So um, a goal is going to be in conflict with an obstacle and goals can be concerned with these domain properties as well. Uh, now, both requirements and goals can be concerned with, with, with assets. We might specify requirements or goals uh, for, uh, for an asset. That might be their reason to exist. But at the same time, and as I've suggested earlier, um, what tasks do is that they kind is that they can show you what requirements and goals l l look like in, in context. So requirements and goals can operationalize down the tasks, but all but also to use case as well. So again, we're not talking much about use cases, but and although they are they have some similarities in the sense that they be have described some behavioral um, uh, pro proper, uh, pro properties, they are related requirements concepts. Um, now, obstacles, because they are obstructions, um, can also be associated with threats and vulnerabilities. And we'll talk a little bit about what these are later. Um, so when we define a goal, um, we need to, or sorry, we need to find a requirement, I should say. We need to specify a requirement name, the type of requirement. So it could be a functional requirement, a data requirement, a security requirement even. Um, the requirement types are based on Valeri. Uh, we specify the domain, so what is the thing, what is the requirement associated with, so it could be associated with, with an asset, which is typically what you want, but you can associate it with environments too, not something you always want to do, and because you usually don't, you're not building an environment, you're building a system, but it, it is something that you can do if you want to use environments as some sort of system petition. Um, the key features of the requirement are the specification, which is describing what the requirement is, and the fit criterion, which is something you would write to actually test your requirement ha ha has been satisfied. Um, these are the fields that we have beneath that. The priority, the rationale, and the orig originated. These are all parts of, of, of the Valeri template. And they add a little bit more information about your requirement. Um, now, what's interesting in Kairos is that we can do... So we support the Valeri quality gateways to some extent on an automated basis. And the way reason we the way we do that is by visualizing requirements as churn-off faces. Now what churn-off faces are, are they are effectively a model that allow us to visualize multiple attributes um, on a face in an easy way. So if we had the different dimensions as a graph, we might not 
be able to, to, to make sense of one bar or another. But if we look at a smiley face, we think that things look good. If the face is, uh, is not so happy or frowning, um, we might see there are problems. So what we're able to do is use churn on faces to quickly indicate um, the quality of requirement. So on, on, the, on the far left, we have a requirement that is complete, has an imperative phrase and has no, no ambiguity in. Um, on the far right, we, we have um, a requirement where there is some level of incompleteness. So we see the eyebrows are pointing down uh, for, for, from, um, or in a uh, slightly negative way. The eye, the eye shape is a, sim, is a circle to indicate that there is a lack of in, imperative tense, such as shall or will. And if there's any known ambiguous or fuzzy terms like or or appropriate, then the smile will turn into a frown, as indeed it has on the right-hand side. Um, now, as I've said, requirements are usually standalone, but you can actually link requirements to other requirements using manual traceability links. And you can set these by these green arrows on the right-hand side of, of the requirements table. And you get to the requirements table from the requirements uh, menu and then the requirements submenu. Now you can add, uh, in this case, we're going to add a contribution link. So we're going to click the, 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 the right arrow, which is going to link our product security configuration requirement to an inbuilt security requirement because the product security requirement motivates the inbuilt security um, uh, requirement. And if we view the requirements model, we can actually see these two churn off face, uh, the faces um, as requirements and we can see our manual uh, motivation link. Now we can add manual traceability links between requirements and other elements as well. But the most typical example where we'd want to use it is to model uh, requirements. So what we don't see here is, um, is indications of pre and post requirements tra tra uh, tra traceability. So sometimes the text of the requirement will change based on whether there is where the requirement has a high priority that doesn't have an adequate level of traceability in. So that, that will give us some indication that there might be something wrong that we, we might want to look at. Not such a problem if we've only, only got two requirements, but if it, as these models no, grow, they, they can be quite handy. Okay, so these are those were requirements. This is an example of a chaos goal model. Um, as you can see, it's it's quite busy. Uh, we have a, um, a maintained telemetry software um, high-level goal, and beneath that, that is refined to three other goals, download telemetry software, upload telemetry software, and software up, up, um, update link. link. And these are linked via an and and refinement. So where we have this white circle, that indicates that these three requirements have to be satisfied in order for the high-level maintained telemetry software requirement to be, to be satisfied. Now, occasionally you will see some black circles as well. So for example, scope pulling um, can be satisfied by either the automated program pulling goal or the manual program pulling goal. So these, um, these um, parallelograms actually represent either goals or requirements because you can link goals to requirements as well. And on this particular goal model, which you access via the model's goal menu, they, they all they, they, they both look the same. Um, you can see some domain properties here as well. So for example, we see the commit telemetry software changes um, goal. Um, in order for that to be satisfied, this Camway verification domain property needs to be true as well. Um, two other elements of interest are our nodes, uh, or sorry, our tasks. So we see a modified telemetry software batch sync task, and we can see that a number of goals are operationalizing that. So these links indicate what goals are being satisfied or what requirements are, are being uh, satisfied for that task to, to be complete. So the, that task is shown what goals are in context. Um, but we also see these yellow um, reverse parallelograms and what these represent are, are, are obstacles. So we see a scope pulling um, obstacle on the right hand side and then we can see that's obstructed by an accidental scope pulling obstacle. So that is a condition that our system does not want. And these are analogous to attack trees in, 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 in traditional um, the threat modeling. So the obstacles could be system conditions, but they could be conditions that attackers want, want to carry out as well. 
So here's an example of, of a goal. So here's a password policy goal. Um, as you'll see, most of these properties are actually environment specific, but you'll also see that they share attributes with requirements as well. There will be a category for a goal. Typically, the most common category you'll want to use is, is maintain. So something that always has to hold like requirements. Goals have priorities. Definitions and fit requirements are also consistent with requirements. We also have this issue field, which we might want to use to add some notes or comments about the goal itself that don't really fit anywhere else. Now you'll see that there is a goal and sub goals tab here and that will allow us to add relationships um, to goals that are at the root of the goal we're working with or sub goals that are refinements of our goal. Um, but we can also add um, goal refinements for using the requirements chaos associations menu. And this is often the quickest way to actually add a goal association. So you'll see there are, there's an environment menu because the associations are environment specific. Um, a head and head, head and tail elements. And if you specify goal and type in, um, if you specify goal and select the name, when you specify the head type, the tail types will, will, will be all automatically updated. So it shouldn't be possible for you to associate a goal with something that is not, um, not that's not permissible in Kairos. As you can see, specify um, an association. So typically this will be and or or. Where the, the refinement indicates there are alternative trees, typically that will be no. And some rationale for that relationship, if you wish. Um, so as you add these associations, if you go to your goals menu, you'll see that um, your goal model will start to grow. So here we have a password policy, and for this to be satisfied, the password the password expiration expiration goal and the password length goal also have have, have have to be satisfied. So once these are satisfied, our password policy goal is is satisfied. Um, as we've said, obstructions are things that will get in the way of goals. So in this case, we, we have a short password obstruction, which is absolutely in tension with our, our password policy. Now, in this case, we'll say that this is this is a vulnerability. So this is something that, that could go wrong, some weakness. It'll have a definition, but we can also specify a probability. Now, this will be between zero and one. And um, usually when we specify this, we might want to give some reason for why um, the probability is the way it is. And we'll see where probability comes in handy very shortly. Like goals, we can we can add links to assets as well, just to indicate what obstacle, what assets are associated with with, with um, that obstacle. And um, just like the goal models, uh, we can view obstacles on goal models. We can view them in obstacle models as well. Uh, but it's quite handy to quickly see things that are getting in the way of, of goals. And we can see these responsibility associations that we alluded to in the, in the last tutorial, where we have an ICT partner who is responsible for password expiration and, and password password length. Okay, so how do these fit with, with, with security concepts? Because this is a tutorial on a security and usability tool after all. Well, before we can talk about that, we need to understand four key security concepts. The first is this idea of a vulnerability. So this is an exploitable system weakness. So imagine we were concerned with the security of, of exams at a university. Um, we, and we are concerned with, with, um, with a exam paper. An exam paper is effectively a piece of paper with something that's secret. So we don't want our students to know what the, um, what, what the information is on the exam paper before it goes out. So we're concerned with confidentiality to a certain extent. Now, one of the vulnerabilities of the exam paper is that it's it's actually on on paper itself. Um, so a vulnerability may not actually be something that's bad. It might actually be uh, productive, but but not but 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 not from a security perspective. So paper is relatively cheap and is relatively flexible. So even though it's water soluble, that's not intrinsically bad, unless. It rains, and we'll talk about that that, that that shortly. So vulnerabilities are exploitable system weaknesses. Um, attackers are human agents fulfilling some malicious role or potentially non um, um, malicious role. And we'll see an example of that shortly. Now, threat to the cause of, of unwanted incidents with the potential to cause harm. Now, what's important here is that you can't define a threat unless you define uh, an, an, an attacker. 
Because if we're defining an attacker and we say something about the attacker's motivations and capabilities, which we have to do, um, if we have a threat and we're saying that an attacker can carry out that threat, but it becomes the obvious that the attacker has neither the motivation or capability to carry out, to carry out the threat, maybe there's something wrong with a threat, or maybe we need to think, think of, of, a new, uh, of a new attacker. So we break these two concepts down. So thinking back to our um, exam paper example, um, although not the traditional security threat, um, rain is something that's going to cause an, 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 an unwanted incident. So a risk is going to be when these things ca ca come to come together. So if um, rain causes our exam paper to, to soak the exam or get wet, we're not going to be able to read the, the, the actual script anymore. Now, the attacker in this case is, is, actual, is actually Mother Nature. Now, actually, attackers are going to be people that want to do something a little bit more malicious. But the key thing is that risks are when attackers carry out threats that, that, that exploit a, 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 a vulnerability. Um, OK, so let's look at some key concepts around security. So we, we have asset that we've seen already and we have assets uh, that could be in one environment or another. So we'll imagine that an asset is in an environment. Now, this asset could be open to a, a, a vulnerability because, as we said, it could have some feature that makes it vulnerable or it, it, it could be threatened. So um, let's say a, an unscrupulous student may want to try and steal uh, the, 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 the exam paper. So we'll have we need to represent the attacker and the threat itself. And there will be certain properties um, that the attacker will be interested in. Because if somebody wants to steal the exam paper because they want to see the exam questions, they're interested in targeting the confidentiality of it because he wants he or she wants that extra edge by knowing these exam questions in advance. And we might categorize that by low, medium, and high. And now these things come together to form a, a risk, which is the detriment of the threat exploiting the, the asset via the vulnerability. And we might choose to respond to that risk in a number or number of ways. We might choose to accept it. We might transfer it to somebody else or we might mitigate it. And we might mitigate this by preventing it, deterring it, detecting it or reacting to it once it, it's detected. Now, on that, on that basis, we will then link responses to goals that we may want to refine uh, to try and find out what actual things have to be specified to really mitigate this risk. And these things that have to be specified will become our requirements. And as you'll see, requirements don't live in the environments. They actually um, always have to hold. But the requirement will give rise to a countermeasure, which is going to be our initial design element that exists to actually um, mitigate a risk. And on that basis of the countermeasure, we might say there are certain security properties that are being fostered as, as a result of that. Now, that becomes important because the countermeasure leads to new assets or combinations um, of, of assets. This is going to have an impact on a role. So someone's going to have to take uh, responsibility for, 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 for the countermeasure. Uh, but attackers could be fulfilling the, the, that, that role as well. Uh, but the roles could, are typically going to be fulfilled by personas that carry out a task. And because that role has some relationship with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the countermeasure, the responsibility could be on the persona to actually live with the countermeasure while carrying out his task. Now, there's a really quick way we can actually evaluate risks, and that's by taking some of the, some of the categorical information that we know. Um, so in Karas, we base this based on um, IEC 661506, which is actually a safety rather than security standard, but has been used by others for quickly evaluating risks as well. And what we might want to do is come up with a, with a simple category for threat likelihood, um, vulnerability se 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 severity, so how likely a threat is that will be carried out and how severe a vulnerability is. And on that basis, simply say, well, what does that actually map to? So we might we might have in the in in this case uh, rows that are based on likelihood and columns that are based on severity, and we get a simple score that we we that we rate as being tolerable. So it's nice and it's quick, but the thing is, it doesn't tell us anything uh, about the assets itself. So what we need is, as much as this rating is useful, we also need another score that's based on the impact to the assets. Um, 
But before we consider that, let's let's look at threat likelihood itself. So we to consider threat likelihood in Kairos based on, on the likelihood of threat minus anything that mitigates the likelihood of that threat. And similarly, the severity of a vulnerability is based on um, not just the severity that you set, but also the any the any anything that mitigates that 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 severity in some way. And usually these mitigations uh, will come from 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 countermeasures these things that we've circled. So if we go back to our original example in, 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 the last, uh, in the last tutorial where we have our attacker who's interested in, in our USB stick, um, we might define threat impact as the product of the security properties associated with the asset and the properties of interest to, to, to the attacker minus um, anything that actually has a mitigating effect on, on that impact. So our actual risk score is going to be based on the likelihood of the risk, the severity of the risk, and 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 the, the, this threat impact. Now that now that in, now these values P T and P A because they're effectively a list of values for different security and privacy properties. We can actually represent it as as a vector, which looks a little bit like that. So the each each so the the value on the left is conf, on on the left of each vector is confidentiality the one to its rights integrity to its rights availability it, it, etc. Um, in general, just like usability, the great greater the number, the more damaging the the consequence of the risk. Now, as we add all these different elements, we can use the risk model in Karras to, uh, to actually see how all these things contribute to risks or, or follow on from risks. So this is one of several different different Karras models. We've seen the task model and asset models and goal models all already, but this model only has the things that are relevant when thinking about risks. Um, so if we look at spoof, spoof telemetry on the, on the left-hand side, we'll see that the, con the things that contribute to that is this in incomplete intrusion, the detection rules box, which is a vulnerability, and false sense sensor readings, which is a threat. And we'll see that the bars um, for the threat indicate the properties of interest to an, an, an attacker. So red in this case is, is, integ is integrity and green is availability. Uh, above that, we'll see our assets, so things like intrusion detection system, enterprise, uh, SCADA server, and we can see how, how these are related, and we can see the, the attackers are associated with, with, with threats as well. So the actual uh, bars in the threats and, and, um, and assets are based, on um, are based on black and, prim and primary covers when it comes to the security. Uh, pro 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 properties, and we've chosen these because we know that these are. We know from working information visualization, these are actually distinctive colors. Now we'll see that we have different shades of red, and vulnerabilities and threats in terms of the shading, it works just like risk. So the higher the value, um, the, the 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 darker the shade of red. And the reason we've gone with with shading for security and usability properties is that it reduces the uh, clutter. So if you, if you look at oceanography maps or maps of, of, of mountainous terrain, you'll see different shades of blue or different shades of brown. We've taken the same principle here with, with, with risk models as well. So the important thing to remember here is that as you add information that's related to risk, this risk model is going to start getting updated. And the final element that we'll see are our requirements, which can be associated with, uh, with, with assets. So let's just go through a simple worked example, and we're going to stay with our industrial control system theme, and we're going to look at this incident where a guy called Vitek Bowden um, uh, planted a logic bomb into a sewage uh, control system in Australia and, and led to the release of several tons, I think it's probably more than several tons, of, of, of sewage into the local environment in Queensland. Um, so we're going to imagine that we are going to sort of model um, what's going on here, or we'll model the planting of, of a logic bomb. It's not precisely what, uh, what, what, what's happened, but as we've been looking at industrial control systems, it's a nice worked example. So here's here's a data flow diagram that we've created in in, in Caris. Now, as I said, it's it's out, out, out of scope to, for, um, for, for for this exercise, but it's not uncommon for you to pick up work that other people have done. So as I, as I, as I said in the last tutorial, the elements in a DFT are actually based on stuff that's already in Kairos. So 
The assets like PLC and plant staff and data stores like SCADA Workshop and Works Diary, um, the, the, these elements or the, en the entities in the case of PLC and plant staff and data stores like SCADA Workstation and Works Diary are, are actually assets of different types. And the processes like Raise Alarm are actually are use cases. So a pretty common, it's pretty common modeling notation that's used that's used by Kairos. And what we often do in threat modeling is look at some of these data flaws or even look at the elements and think about what could possibly go wrong and then use that to try and find possible threats and vulnerabilities. So let's look at um, this, this failure event data flow that goes between the PLC entity to, 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 to the raise alarm. I might want to ask myself, what could stop that event from actually firing? And what I might want to do is create uh, an, a, an, an, an attack tree to actually model that. Um, so here's here's something I worked on earlier. So let's imagine we have this root this root obstacle this root attack of PLC alarm not transmitted. And for that to happen, the PLC cable must be disconnected, or there must be a hardware failure, or the alarm itself might not have been created. And if that alarm wasn't created, it could be because the PLC was misconfigured or there was, there was a logic problem. Now, actually, what we're seeing on the bottom of, of, this, of this slide here is not actually an attack tree, uh, but an obstacle model. So what I've done offline is I actually drew up the, 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 the attack tree on a whiteboard. I used something called GraphBiz to sort of, uh, to sort of render it into something I could actually import in, into Kairos. And what we, what we ended up with was this obstacle model. And, and as a result, we haven't set any probabilities yet. So everything is the same. It has the same color because we don't know whether one, uh, one obstacle is, is more likely than another. Now, once we import this, we can start adding pro uh, probability values. So in this case, logic bombs don't seem uh, very likely, but PLC misconfiguration is a bit more likely. And what we'll see is that um, we can, is that the root obstacles to these obstacles, the colors change um, depending on the relationship and, and the type of, of, of refinement. So in the case of PLC alarm, not, 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 not tr transmitted, for, for that obstacle to happen, any one of these obstacles like PLC alarm not created, the network cable disconnect and PLC ha ha to failure can happen. So you don't need all three, you need any one. So the actual probability is, is the sum of the three prob probability values. And that's why the PLC alarm um, not transmitted value is so high. Now, in this case, we're, we're, we're going to look at, the, at, at this logic bomb. We can see that the logic bomb obstacle is actually um, an obstruction to the validate P PLC software changes. Now, let's look at this PLC um, configuration error. Now, that seems like a, a, a vulnerability to me. It is an attack. It, it is just a feature of the system that this configuration is liable to some form of, of misconfiguration. Now, we're only going to have a single environment here, but we think this is a, a, a vulnerability of marginal severity, and it actually affects uh, PLC elements, PLCs, and STCS application. So this is a nice example of a vulnerability. You can set vulnerabilities via the risk vulnerabilities menu. Um, now, as we said, before we can define a threat, we need to define an, 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 an attacker. So um, in the real world, uh, the attacker's name was called uh, Vitek Bowden. So we've, we've called our attacker Victor. And he's a contractor, an expert in SCADA systems. Uh, haven't helped develop them over for, for 15 years ago, but he's been forced to take, to, to, to take a pay cut. Now, we might draw this information from source information about hackers. We could create a persona and we could make Victor just a, a, a summary of the information we've got about the persona. But we want to say what sort of role uh, Victor fills in, what his motivation might be and what his capabilities are. Um, so it'll, this will tell us something about what Victor can do when, when, when we're defining the threat. Now, in this case, we're going to find that the threat of, of a lot logic bomb. So this is planting some code into the PLC, which is going to cause a device failure upon some, some, some set conditions. So threats in Kairos defined in the risk threats menu. They have a name, they have a type. Um, and for environment, they have some notion of, 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 of likelihood. Now, the likelihood of this is, is actually fairly low. So we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to over overhead the likelihood. We're going to say it's remote. Attackers Victor, it's targeting the STCS application. And the properties of interest of Victor 
is integrity because he wants to corrupt the P of the P of the PLC logs to some extent, but he absolutely wants to disrupt uh, water delivery or, or, in the, or in this case, waste, wastewater delivery and, and management. So integrity is in, in this case is a means to an end, which is why the availability property for, the, for, uh, for this threat is actually higher. Now, the aim here is to flood the, is, is, is to, to flood the region. So we, we need to specify um, the, the threat and the vulnerability together. And if these exist in at least one environment, the environments tab is going to be populated for all the environments that are actually updated. So surprise, surprise, both of these things are related to the default environment. And the rating is calculated automatically based on the threat likelihood and the vulnerability uh, so severity. Now, the scores are calculated automatically as well based on the values that, that are actually set based on the formula that we, we, we've seen earlier. Now, before you can define, define a risk, what you need to do is define a misuse case scenario that really describes how all these things could, could come together. So on the left-hand side of this misuse case pane, um, the contents are, are automatically uh, generated. The attacker, assets, objectives, likelihood, severity, all generated automatically. But what you need to do is write a narrative that is reflective of the information on the left-hand side. So the key thing here is that if you can't, there might be something wrong with the data that, that, that fed into the risk. So this is your cue to sort of go back and look at whether you were right about your assets, threats, vulnerabilities, um, uh, etc. The other thing as well that we'll think about is is the score, and we'll see when we when we, when we look at the risk models what the impact or quick ways of impacting that might be. So as we add all this information, our, our risk analysis, our, our risk model is updated, and we get something a little bit like this. And if you want to know uh, where these different elements and the values come from we can actually run through our risk analysis formula again. So we have um, a threat likelihood here of two, and you can see here that it's a, a, sl uh, a fairly dark shade, but, 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 not, but not, not too dark. Um, the severity of the vulnerability is one, so that, that's a slightly lighter shade of red. And we'll see that the threat impact uh, is based on the, um, the security properties of the related assets. So in this case, it's just SCCS application and the properties of interest to, 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 to the attacker uh, in the threat, which in this case is, is, is logic bomb. And this risk score is then based on multiplying the, uh, the likelihood and severity with this with, with the threat impact. So we get this, we get this risk uh, vector, which pretty much um, uh, rounds down to about um, 10. Um, now, if you want to do something about that risk, we have to specify a risk response, which we do from the risk responses menu. Um, now, in this case, what we want to do is we want to actually de deter the attacker in some way. So there's not a massive amount we can do about misconfiguration, but maybe we can deter Victor from actually wanting to plant a logic bomb in the first place. So so, so this, this is the information that we need to provide. We need to provide the risk um, and once we specify uh, the environment, the sort of the, 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 the actual response type. And once you do that, the actual response name of deter flood to region will be automatically um, generated. Now, once you've specified a response, one of the things you can do in the response table is generate goals. Now, the reason you want to do that is because your, your response, if you're going to incorporate that response in your design, you need to specify that as a goal. Um, so if we if we, although we won't see it in, in, we don't see it in this picture, you can specify response goals from the from the response uh, menu. When you do that, that generates a goal called uh, deter flood region, but it also de um, it also um, generates refined goals. In this case, deter PLC configuration error and deter logic bomb based on on the vulnerability and then the threat. So to satisfy that deter flood flood region goal, all we have to do is make sure we satisfy one and one of those goals. Because if we do that, well, we've actually responded to our risk. Now, let's, let's imagine that we've done, we, we, we've done our goal model and we've said, right, in order to deal with, uh, with this, we're going to specify a requirement called PLC, PLC change or, or authentication. So what we're going to do is require technicians to authenticate with identity services before they can modify a PLC. And this is because it will deter an attacker from making authorized changes. Um, we can test this because if we if we uh, upload a PLC modification that you're not when you're not authenticated, it, it's failed. 
And this is something that we found from doing a little bit of threat modeling. So once we add that, and once we've added a chaos association between um, our, let's say, um, a related related um, goal, which in this case is deter logic bomb, our goal model looks a little bit like this. Now, once we've linked that requirement to our goal model, we can then specify a countermeasure um, which will be able to effectively mitigate um, the risk. And um, so we need to define we needed to define the goals from the response so we could see the goals in context. And we needed we needed the requirement because our countermeasure is effectively going to be satisfying the requirements. So we define countermeasure from the risks countermeasure menu. So in this case, we're going to define a countermeasure called PLC authentication service. So it's a software type. Here's a uh, description is that it's integrating Acme Identity Services to facilitate authentication for the software update workflow. So it's a little bit more solution specific than the requirement was. Um, it's got a lot of environment specific properties, roughly divided by security and usability. But before that, we need to indicate its cost. Usually, if we're talking about developing in new software or doing some form of system integration, then unless you're building a submarine, um, the costs for software integration are usually fairly high because you've got to get developers or pay developers and do, and do testing, etc. Um, so, in order to link this back to risk analysis, we need to specify the requirements. And once we specify the requirement, when we click on plus in the effectiveness table, we can choose whether this countermeasure will either address the related vulnerability or the, or, or the related threat. And we can do that because the requirement is linked back to, back to goals that are generated from the response. So in this case, we think this is highly effective at deterring uh, the attacker because attackers will no longer think they can actually hide behind uh, anonymity. And as a result, we think this targets confidentiality because it's gonna stop a modification from an unauthorized uh, users. So if Victor is not unauthorized to change a change change of PLC, that this can actually stop that. Uh, but also because it facilitates logging, it potentially fosters um, accountability as well. Um, if we indicate the roles that are affected by this, what we then get is actually a list of related tasks. So in this case, um, the affected role is going to be uh, is going to be in instrument technicians. So we we have a persona called Barry who modifies PLC software, um, that task could be impacted by, um, by this particular countermeasure. So what we want to do is try and capture that in some way. So in this case, we think it's going to be a slight hindrance on the duration, a slight hindrance on demands, and a slight hindrance on conflict with personal goals and organizational goals. Um, now, that's got an impact on the usability score that we talked about in the, in, in, in the last lecture. So as you might recall, the usability score are based on assigning variables to ISO 9241.11 components. But this time, the values aren't between 0 and 3. They're between minus 3 and 3, where minus 3 indicates that um, the countermeasure is of great help to somebody, and 3 indicates the countermeasure is of great hindrance. Because remember, the higher the value, the less usable the score is. So our countermeasure task usability um, um, equation is pretty much like the task use, use usability um, equation. In fact, it's, it's, it's almost identical, except for the values that go in. And our overall usability is based on the usability of the task plus the usability um, um, of, the, of the countermeasure task usability. Because if this is a huge hindrance, it's going to add some sort of um, score to, to the usability. So it's going to increase it, its, um, its value, and we'll, and we'll see how that works shortly. So here is our reviser risk analysis model. So the first thing you'll see is that our flood region uh, risk diamond was dark red, but it, it, it's now light red because the, we can quickly see that it's actually addressed the risk. Um, we'll also see a whole bunch of new elements for the response, the connected uh, requirement, the countermeasure, and the assets that we've actually generated as the basis of, of the countermeasure. So when you create a countermeasure, you don't create an asset instantly, but you can choose to create assets based on the countermeasure, and in, 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 and in this case we have. Um, we can see that the effectiveness value of high has given us um, this mitigating value of three, which has rendered the, the likelihood value down to minus one. When we see things that are minus one, we will round up to, to, to zero. 
Um, we don't see any any impact on this on, on severity, but but we can see that we have this mitigating property because we've said the confidential value is high, accountability value is low. Um, that means that the the, the, the threat impact um, is going to be taking is, is the threat impact value we had but before is going to be minus that. Um, not a huge difference, but if we look at the actual score, we've got zero times one times our value, and anything times zero is, is going to be zero. And that kind of makes sense, because we've effectively, by reducing the likelihood down, down, to, but, uh, down to zero, we've effectively mitigated the risk. However, we will also see that this task, Elixir, is actually a darker blue than, uh, than, than, than it originally was, which means that it has come at a cost of usability. So at this point, what you're going to want to do is go back and, 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 and look, and number one, look at your assets, because your attacker might actually want to attack that authentication service in some way, but you might want to have a look at the task as well. So here we are uh, re-evaluating our task. We see this is our original task description, but the information in bold at the bottom is a change that we've made as a result of, a, of, a, of the countermeasure. So in, in this case, we're talking about adding a description of a change made um, and, 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 and re-authenticating. Re so it's not that significant, but it is a change based on, on the countermeasure. And this explains why, why, why the score has actually gone up. Um, now, not only is the risk model up updated, but any other rated models are updated automatically as well. So we'll see our goal model here. We now have this PLC authentication service he um, he hexagon, which, which is our which is our countermeasure. So that is effectively responsible for um, making sure the PLC change authentication happens. However, there is a conflict between that and the modified PLC task because there is actually a hindrance value associated with it. And that's how we represent it in the goal model. Okay, what I'm gonna move on to now are some of the other aspects of, of, of Kairos that are sort of supplemental to modeling itself. So sooner or later, you're gonna to want to do something with all this analysis you've carried out. And the easiest way of getting your analysis to people is by generating some form of documentation. So there are a number of specifications you can generate via Kairos. You can generate a Valeria uh, compliant requirement specification. You can generate some doc specification on, on personas, and you can also generate uh, data protection Im impact assessments, um, particularly useful if, you, if you're doing a data protection Im impact assessments. Um, now, typically, it's unlikely that you're going to want, want to use the stuff that's generated as is. So it can be quite helpful to generate your document in, r rather than generating it in PDF, which you can do, you can generate it in Word or Open Document Text, because then you can tweak or customize your document document uh, as you wish. Um, it's also helpful as well, because if you want to actually take, take the models that are actually generated, you can take them from the generated document and put them somewhere else. But you may also want to be aware of a bookmarklet called SVG Crowbar. Now, there, there's a link to this in the Karas documentation. And what this allows you to do is it will allow you to extract the SVG from one of your one of your one of your Kairos models. And what you can do then is use um, an SVG editor like like um, Inkscape to just tweak the SVG itself. So if you want high quality output, that might be an alternative that, that you could consider using. Um, we've talked a bit about Kairos model files at the beginning of, of, the, of, of, of the last tutorial. And we talked about this idea that importing models is analogous to loading models and exporting models is analogous to um, uh, so sorry, importing is analogous to, to, to loading and exporting is analogous to, to, to saving. However, Kairos itself does have some uh, some scripts called C import and C export, which can be run on the server itself for doing bulk import and, and bulk export. Now, this can be useful if you're working with partial Kairos models. So you might actually have incremental bits of a system design in different Kairos models. And you can use C import in such a way that you can incrementally add things to an, an, an existing model uh, model database itself now if you add this with a little with a little bit of scripting you can do some quite complicated things so the example on the right is from um the webinars project that i'll be talking about in the in the case studies very shortly 
And the data that we used for Webinos, we kept in a GitHub a repository in a whole slew of different formats. We had requirements in Spreadsheet, we had dot files to visualize requirement concept maps. And what we had is a script that would actually convert all of these different things into Kairos models and would then import that into Kairos and would then export this into an, another, another format. Now, since then, we've created a script called Model Import Web. And this is basically C import, but it doesn't have, have it doesn't have to have to be run on the server itself. So you could actually run it in any environment where it's got Python installed. And all you have to do is just point it to, to the URL to of your Kairos server and give it the credentials you need to access. So that's quite helpful if you want to do some sophisticated importing and exporting of model data. Um, if you want to be really sophisticated, you can also use the Kairos API. So the Kairos user interface uses the Kairos API itself, which is which is a, which is a RESTful API um, to effectively present the information on the UI. But the API is available for any anyone to use. So the key operation here is this API session uh, post, because if you post to that and you provide your credentials, you can get a session ID and then you can talk um, to any of the other, the other Kairos endpoints. So in this example, we've we've uh, posted to the API sessions endpoint to actually get a session ID and then we've used that to get the list, uh, the information about uh, the, 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 the sysadmin role. A really nice example of this API in practice is the, is the Persona Helper. Um, Chrome extension, which is on the Kairos platform um, GitHub account, so you can see exactly how that works. If you want a more interactive experience and playing with the API, you can also have a play with the API documentation up on Swagger Hub. And then the advantage of that is that you actually have some, some documentation for the different attributes of the endpoints, but you've also got a virt virtual server, so you can actually test what the output of a particular endpoint is, which is quite handy for actually testing things without um, having to set up your own Kairos server. What I'm gonna try and do now, try and round off the tutorial, although not quite round off the tutorial, is go through a few a few case studies. So these are real world applications of Kairos that we, that we can talk about. We know there are organizations that are using Kairos that for lots of reasons we can't talk about. Uh, there have also been some very interesting student projects at BU in the past that have used Kairos. So projects that spring to mind is one where someone used student to create uh, an offboarding policy for a recruitment agency. And that found a whole bunch of problems that the, uh, the recruitment agency had never thought about. Recently, we've seen Kairos used to improve penetration testing information management. So uh, a connector was created, which integrated Kairos with the Dradis platform to come up with a means of better reporting penetration testing risks. And in the past, people have developed mo mo mobile apps for the listing asset listations, both with the API and by just creating a XML files that could just be bulk exported to Kairos. But here are some actual examples of where Kairos was used in conjunction uh, with a conducive uh, design process. So one of the earliest case studies of Kairos was to specify a, a software repository, specifically a version control system for industrial control system for a water company in the UK. Now this entailed a whole, this entailed using uh, the whole slew of functionality from Kairos. So we created personas, we did threat modeling, and we did the number of participants workshops to create tasks, goals, and, 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 and risk models. So in this case, the company had a few potential solutions in mind, but it wanted to go through this exercise to see if the requirements um, for usability and security kind of match the different technical solutions that they were actually um, looking at. Now, later on, we actually did some other work with the company um, to analyze their security policies in, in light of, of Stuxnet, which at the time had just uh, had just become a big thing and a lot of water companies were worried about the impact this had and what certain people were worried about was was a knee-jerk uh, reaction where they locked things down but in event but also inadvertently stopped people from working so in this case what we did is we created we created personas we we analyzed the policy itself and turned it into, into, a, into, in, into a goal tree. We found a number of risks and we actually used ta task models to actually show the impact of risks to key tasks and, 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 and personas. Um, we 
believe that the company itself we worked with did a red team task and they found that the results of that test actually corroborated with the, with the work that we actually carried out in terms of finding the same risks and having roughly the, the same risk risk impact scores. But of course, our the, the, the research we did was actually a lot less invasive than, the, than a physical penetration test. Uh, now, the Acme Water Model in Kairos is based on a highly anonymized version of both of, of these case studies. So if you want to know a little bit more about industrial control system security, this is quite a nice sample model to play with. Uh, Webinos was a European project that ran for about three years, had about 20 or 30 partners, and it was a, I think it was, uh, it was well, it was a thing of 20 or 30 mil million euros in, va in terms of value to all these different partners. It was covered at the time in Wired and BBC, and this was effectively a web-based middleware. So it was a runtime environment that would allow web apps to discover other devices and services based on technical and contextual information. And one of the key things about WebNOS is that it had to be secure by, by design. So Keras was used for lots of different things. It was used to build context of use models. So we built personas, tasks to try and model the key context of use that White WebNOS would need to be situated in. It was used for threat modeling. We subsequently used WebNOS, although we didn't intend to use it for requirement specifications, we did use it for requirement specifications. So the picture on the right is one of our colleagues. And what we did is we did a participative requirements exercise that entailed using concept maps where the bits of paper were names of requirements. And what we did is we wanted to model the relationship between between different requirements to help people better understand what these requirements were, where they were needed. So we had a low fidelity approach, but we then marked up these uh, concept maps in graphs and exported them in, in into Kairos. And the gentleman on the right is literally doing just that. He's he's editing the graphs file. Uh, which we subsequently exported into Kairos. The requirements themselves were actually on Excel spreadsheets and we exported these into Kairos as well. Uh, but I think as we saw from the example from a few slides back, all the source data was actually in a version controlled repository. So the, so the Kairos models were literally generated on the fly via a build script. So if the build script broke, then it suggested there might be something wrong with, with, with the design data. Now, what we also used, um, Caris 4 was for doing architectural risk analysis. So although we're not talking about architectural risk and architectural um, architectural patterns in, in, this, in this tutorial, the functionality was generated to, to, to actually support this particular project. So we developed components, uh, we developed components and connectors, put, put them in patterns, and we did, uh, we came up with some attack surface metrics to try and see what the impact of these patterns were in terms of ambiguity analysis, in terms of attack resistance, etc. And um, we have a, the sample model, uh, which is based on the WebMaster design data as one of the sample models in Kairos. So have a play of that. Uh, this was actually um, this actually a student project that was actually subsequently published. And is um, what this idea was was could we use Kairos to do a data protection Im Im impact assessment? So GDPR was a big thing at the time because it, it had just um, gone live. And we were working with an, an, an e-prescription software house uh, that was local to our university. And what they produce is e-prescription e software that pharmacy departments and hospitals can use. And they wanted to develop a mobile patient-led application that would allow someone who was, take, who was having some chemotherapy treatment at home to, uh, to actually send information to the e-prescription system so you didn't, didn't have, have to drag them for, 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 from home. To, to hospital. Now the specification at the time, because this was a very early design, just had a single uh, sentence. So the process that uh, that Joshua Josh Joshua came up with, that he subsequently published, came up with a very refined uh, mo model where he discovered requirements based on specifications, based on workshops and other background research, and he came up with effectively a data um, an ICO compliant or reasonably ICO compliant uh, privacy impact uh, assessment um, the document. Now, what we also came up with in the process of doing this were a number of model validation checks that we could use to find potential GDPR uh, problems due to processes that weren't connected, connected to goals, data that was being stored that wasn't actually uh, was, wasn't going anywhere. So it wasn't telling us that 
the early, this very initial design was compliant, but it would tell us if there were potential non-compliant issues. Uh, what we've been doing over the last year or so is working on something called Huahana. So Huahana is a platform that enables agile teams to create digital products and services for security and privacy de designed in. So back when we developed Kairos, it was designed to support engineering uh, activities. But what we've noticed in the last year or so is that there's a real need for collaboration between UX researchers and security researchers in very agile products where people are using concepts like epics, user stories, um, attacker stories. So we've got, we received some funding to build a minimal viable product with this thing called um, Huahana. Uh, you can see that it supports the the structuring of different user stories by different, by different epics and we can group them by themes and we can look at and outline these stories and quickly see what, um, uh, whether any of these things could be at risk. So on the, on, on the diagram on, on the top right, you'll see a number of boxes that have red pills that indicate that there are actually risks associated with these stories. So if you're doing some very early stage design and you're knocking up some new stories, uh, if someone's doing some independent sec um, to, to security analysis, it can be quite nice to find out if your if your use story could actually be at risk of something. Um, but the nice thing about Huahana is that although the user interface looks very, very different from Kairos, it is built on Kairos, on Kairos te technology. So much of, much of the platform is Kairos, but we have an additional layer on top of this, which provides the Huahana specific services. And of course, the UI is completely different, but the UI is, is, is effectively relying on the Kairos API. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you could do with the Kairos API too. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this tutorial by telling you where you can find out a little bit more information about Kairos, because we can only really scratch the surface of what you do with a platform in the tutorial. Um, the book is quite useful. So the book is Designing Usable and Secure Software with Iris and Kairos. So this is something I put together recently, which is providing a lot more detail in the stuff I've, on the stuff I've sc only scratched on in the tutorial. It's also got a bit more detail on some of the case studies I've alluded to as well. And we wrote the book to support a course we have at Bournemouth University on, on, on security by design. So if you're, if you're following the tutorial because you're interested in training or putting together a course, you might find the book a useful complement for any course you've got in mind because you can see how the chapters relate to teaching that we do at, at Bournemouth. Um, the documentation is incredibly um, useful. Open source documents are open source projects are not well known for the quality of documentation. But my feeling is, if we want people to use Kairos, if we don't have decent documentation, no one is simply going to read the code. So there's pretty detailed instructions on not just installing Kairos but using Kairos as well. And the way the code, the documentation is maintained, is that it's maintained in the same place as the code. So typically. If we make a code change, uh, we are probably ch we are almost certainly going to be changing the documentation at the same time. So the documentation does change frequently. It doesn't change significantly, but when it does change, we do change the documentation too. We also have a number of video tutorials on on YouTube, and it's quite possible that you discovered this particular uh, this particular tutorial from the Karis YouTube channel. So we created this channel to support. Our teaching, our teaching of Kairos, but it's a tutorial on different aspects of using Kairos. So you will see Kairos used, uh, but you also find out a little bit more about why Kairos is used in, in, in the way it is. And over the next few months, what we're going to try and do is try and add, 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 add more content based on things we haven't quite described in, in the video tutorials yet and things that people, people request. And that kind of brings us on to our final slide. Um, Kairos is stable enough for you to use operationally right now. Uh, but the nice thing about open source projects is that, and the uh, open source projects in general, and Kairos in particular, is, is that Kairos is there for people to use, extend, and even commercialize as, as they wish. Um, although I'm the lead developer of Kairos, I'm not the only person that's worked on Kairos over the years. And there's always opportunities for people to contribute to Kairos or, or, or collaborate. And if that's something of interest, please reach out. Other than that, I hope you hope you found this tutorial useful.